presentation here that I want to share with you. I call it the marvels of the Quran, of course, as Fari Ammar, may Allah preserve him, and said, this is the month of the Quran, Shahrul al Quran, Shahrul Ramadan, Alladhi unzil fihi al Quran, Hudan lin nas, Bayinati man al-Huda wal Quran. The month of Ramadan is the month in which the Quran was revealed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed the Quran to his Habib, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is a great gift for us. And the Quran is that which is recited. The word Quran means a recitation. Here's a verse from Surah Al-Nisa, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبَّرُونَ Quran. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, in meaning, some of the meanings may suggest, don't they penetrate the meanings of the Quran? Tadabbur, a dubur is, some, is the end of something. So, tadabbur, means to really have a deep, substantive engagement with something. Do they not engage deeply, substantively, with the Qur'an? If the Qur'an was from other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then there would have been mm, discrepancies, contradictions, imbalances, asymmetries, in another ayah of the Quran, in Surah Muhammad, وسلم, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, أَفَلَا يَتَدَبُّرُونَ الْقُرْآنَ عَمْ عَلَى قُلُوبٍ أَقْفَالُهَا Do they not penetrate the meanings of the Quran, or are their, are their hearts sealed off, or locked off? In the qalb, according to Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, the word qalb in the Quran means the mind. We call it the spiritual heart. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ بِهَا They have قُلُوب, they have hearts by which they don't understand. لَهُمْ قُلُوبٌ يَعْقِلُونَ بِهَا You see? They have hearts with which they reason. This is the spiritual heart. Right? So not the physical heart of the chest, not the physical uh, brain in our skull, but the spiritual heart, which is metaphysical. So these are some lata'if, these are some subtleties about the Qur'an that I think maybe you'll find interesting, inshallah ta'ala. Hopefully this won't be boring for you. So the style of the Qur'an is insuperable. So maybe people can take some notes here, at least mental notes. Right? Insuperable means it's impossible to imitate. It's impossible to top. The Qur'an is mu'jiz. Mu'jiz means that it has an internal incapacitating uh, element. Anyone who tries to imitate the Qur'an uh, will be incapacitated. And this is the aqidah of Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah, that it is, with, it is not within human capacity to imitate the Qur'an, the style of the Qur'an, the eloquence of the Qur'an. Right? So that's what we mean by insuperable. In this ayah in the Quran, وَإِن كُنْتُ فِي رَيْبٍ مِمَّا نَزَّلْنَا عَلَىٰ عَبْدِنَا فَأَتُوا بِسُورَةٍ مِمِثْلِهِ وَدْعُوا شُهَدَاءَكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ إِن كُنْتُمْ صَادِقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is a ajeeb, amazing verse. If you are in doubt as to what we reveal, this is chapter 2 verse 23, Baqarah 23. If you are in doubt as to what we reveal to our servant, meaning the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, from time to time, tanzil is a revelation that comes down from time to time. There's an inzal, which is from the lower to the sama' al dunya, which happened a little to other. Inna anzal nahu. The mustard is inzal. Nazzalna ala abdina fa'atu bi surah tanzil, that we have revealed from time to time to our servant. Then produce one surah like unto it uh, and call for your aid your witnesses. If you speak the truth, and if you if you can't do that, if you don't do that, and you will not do that, then fear the fire. Fear the fires, fuel as men and stones, prepared for those 
reject faith. This is ajib. The Quran in Surah Al-Baqarah is making a prediction that the Quran itself will be a sui generis text. Sui generis means one of a kind, the absolute masterpiece in the Arabic language. This is a prophecy of the Quran. Nothing holds a candle to the Quran. You've had uh, people in the past try to imitate the Quran in the late 90s. Um, I remember a group of Christians, they wrote something called Furqan al-Haq. <laughs> it was a total flop. It's collecting dust in the closets of churches all around the world. It's supposed to be a game changer. Most of the text is plagiarized from the Quran. There's nothing like the Quran. Chapter 10, verse 37. This Quran cannot be produced by other than Allah. Rather, is a confirmation of what went before, of what went before. Confirmation, tasdiq and tafsil, an explanation of revelation. No doubt it is from the Lord of the worlds. This is the insuperability, i'jaz al Quran. Is an open challenge to, to this day. An open challenge called the tahaddi, the tahaddi, the challenge of the Quran to produce something like unto it. Nothing's even close. You know, it's interesting when the Western Orientalists, when they first looked at the Quran, and I'll come to this, they said, you know, because they're coming from a certain Western framework, very linear framework. Once upon a time, then they lived happily ever after. The Quran is not like that. The Quran is circular, and we'll see that. It's chiastic, it's concentric, there's parallelism. So they said, this is jumbled, and what is going on here? It's, it's going from this story to that story, going back in time, forward in time. It's, it's going from third person to second person and all of this. And then they studied Semitic rhetoric. And they said, oh, there's no way that one man produced this. So there was a very popular theory uh, John Wandsborough, who was a SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies in London, his, he was very popular and he said that this must have been composed by a committee during the Abbasid period in the 8th century. A committee of scholars, of historians, of poets, of linguists. It had to have been. And then, shortly thereafter, the entire Quran was found in 7th century manuscripts. The entire Quran is found many times over in 7th century CE manuscripts, which absolutely falsifies his theory. Okay. Nice try. So they admit it, this is a masterpiece. The Quran is multiformic. What does multiformic mean? This is another incredible aspect of the Quran. When I first discovered this, I had to lie down for a few seconds. This is amazing. In other words, you can read the rasam, the, the consonantal skeleton of the Quran in different ways. In all of these readings, these qira'at, these are reading traditions, they all go back to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They, they are all kawato, they all are multiply attested. Right? Very basic example. We say maliki yawm din the owner of the day of judgment. We also say maliki yawm din the king of the day of judgment. Right? Because a malik, an owner, may not make laws. A king makes laws. An owner may own something, but may not make laws. He's not the sharia. But a king makes laws, but he may not own something. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is both of these. How many times did the Sahaba hear the Prophet ﷺ recite the Fatiha? I did the math one time. It's in the tens of thousands. You're telling me there was there's a difference of opinion? They, they weren't sure. They didn't say Malik or Medic. Logically, it doesn't. Forget about Asani. It doesn't work logically. Of course he said it both ways. They heard the Fatiha. They heard the Quran continuously. The Sahaba say that we learned Surah, uh, Surah Al-Kahf, just memorizing it from the, the khutbah of the Prophet This is how much he would recite Surah Al-Kahf in the khutbah. We just memorize the whole thing, listen to his khutbah. So they were constantly hearing the Quran. Another example, look at here, chapter 5 or 6. This is a verse about wudu. Anoint your heads and wash your feet. Another reading. Anoint your heads and anoint your feet. 
Both readings are attributed to the Prophet Why? Because sometimes we wash our feet. And there are occasions in which we wipe our feet under conditions. This is a multiformism of the Quran. It's incredible. No book is like this. And the Quran is polyvalent. It contains various levels of meaning. So Surah Al-Kothar, right? Beautiful surah, a, a surah of consolation, of tasliya, to, to, to give consolation to the heart of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu He says in a hadith that is sound that Kothar is nahrun fil jannah, the river in paradise. But Kothar fo'al, right? This is a hapax. A box means this is the only occurrence of, the, of this word in the entire Qur'an. This word does not appear anywhere else in the Qur'an. Right? And the nature of the word kawthar, it's mubalaha, it's extremely em emphatic. So the ulama mentioned, one of the meanings, obviously, that's given to us from the Prophet ﷺ himself is nahrun fil jannah. It's a river in paradise, and the waters flow into the hawb, into his basin which is just outside of paradise. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us to drink from the hawd from his blessed hand, sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam. Drink this, you'll never be thirsty again. This is one of the meanings. But the ulama mentioned other things. Kawthar. They mentioned the maqam mahmud on the day of judgment, the praiseworthy station. They mentioned the shafa'a, the intercession on the day of judgment. They mentioned the wahi itself, descending upon the heart of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They mentioned other things. And here's something interesting. Every surah in the Qur'an is a coherent literary unit. And many of the suwar, they have this type of chiastic structure, circular structure, structural coherence, right? Nivam as a guide to tafsir. So this is very interesting. When we look at this surah, we have three ayat. We notice that the first and the third ayahs, they have sort of a semantic relationship with each other. They mirror each other. Look how they start. Inna, inna. They start the same. One is inna, one is inna, but that's harfa toki. And look how they end. al kawthar al abtar So when we go to the books of Asbab al nuzul Right? Asbab al-Nuzul is one of the disciplines, one of the Rulum al-Qur'an, which is extremely important to study, historical contextualizations of the Qur'an. We're told that the son of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu Abdullah alayhi salam, his second son passed away in Mecca. And when his son passed away, his neighbors who were mushrikeen, they started celebrating. You could hear them celebrating. Can you imagine your son dies? Your child dies and your neighbors are celebrating. A few days later, a mushrik named Al As ibn Wahid, he approached the Prophet and he said, You are now Abtar. You're like you're cut off. Al Abtar means cut off. Your lineage is done. Your lineage dies with you. You have no sons. Right? No one's going to remember your name after you. <laughs> no one's going to remember his name after him. Do you know right now somebody is saying, Ashadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah? Right now it's happening. And this is happening until the sa'a. Every second of time until the sa'a, somebody is saying, Ashadu anna Muhammadur Rasulullah. His dhikr is raised continuously until the sa'a. And the yawm al qiyamah. And in Jannah. Forever. Right? So al abtar is someone whose lineage is cut off. Al kawthar is therefore a source of great lineage. Because these are antonyms. That's the interplay of these two ayat. Al-Kawthar and Al-Abtar are antonyms, antithetical parallelism. This is very common in Semitic rhetoric. There's synonymic parallelism. Sometimes it's their synonyms. Sometimes they're opposites. So let me ask you, who is Al-Kawthar? We've given you Kawthar. The family of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, specifically a saint of Fatima Zahra, alayhi salam, his daughter Fatima. This is from the fasais of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. The special qualities of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is that his ahl bayt, his lineage, is through his daughter. Right, and then it goes to Hassan and Hussein. So this this shows the, the station, the rutba, the daraja 
of our liege lady, Fatima Zahra alayhi salam. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam, he said, Fatima bu bak'atu minni. Fatima is a piece of me. فَمَنْ أَغْضَبَنِي فَمَنْ أَغْضَبَهَا فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَنِي وَمَنْ أَغْضَبَنِي فَقَدْ أَغْضَبَ اللَّهِ مُكُمَ قَالَ عَلَيْهِ صَلَاةُ وَسَلَامُ Fatima is like a piece of, is a piece of me. You know, like we say, she's my heart. You know, she's my sweetheart. She's my liver. In Spanish, what do they say? Right? You say to your sweetheart, literally, you're my heart. So this is the darling of the Prophet ﷺ, sweetheart of the Prophet ﷺ. So one of the names our ulama mentioned for Fatima السلام, is al kawthar Ajib. She is the fountain that springs this, inc this incredible family, Ahlid Bayt, the Sadat. So here is Ayatul Kursi, the verse of the throne. And Sahada Tustari, rahimahullah, he said, here, a'adhamu ayatin fil Qur'an. This is the greatest ayah in the Qur'an. All of the Qur'an is great because it's all wahi, obviously. Right? It's all wahi, so it all, it, it's all the same in that respect. But depending on the subject matter of the ayat, there's a hierarchy. So Imam al-Ghazali, he wrote a book called Jawahir al-Qur'an, and it's translated, and I recommend that you get this book. The Jewels of the Qur'an. And he says in this book, Imam al-Ghazali, rahimahullah, he says the Qur'an has six aims. Right? The, the, the maqsal al-Qur'an has sitta. There's six aims of the Qur'an. The first aim of the Qur'an is ta'rifu mad'u ilayhi, is to acquaint you with the one that you're being called to, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there are certain ayat in the Qur'an that describe Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He says, dhikru that, dhikru sifat, dhikru al-af'al. They describe the essence, they describe the mm, attributes, and they describe the actions of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these are the highest types of ayat in the Qur'an, right? These are the greatest ayat of the Qur'an. And the reason is because ma'rifatullah, uh, theology or gnosis of God, is the greatest science. The greatest ilm is the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So he says that these are the yawaqit of the Qur'an. That's what he said. Yawaqit. These are the rubies of the Qur'an. And then he says the second aim of the Qur'an, ta'rifu asirat al-mustaqim, is to acquaint you with the straight path. How do you get to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? In Imam al-Razi says, asirat al-mustaqim is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He is asirat al-mustaqim. And he calls these verses ad-durar. These are the pearls of the Qur'an. So Imam al-Ghazali, he says, why, do you, why are you satisfied with just working, walking on the shore of the Qur'an? You're walking on the shore collecting shells, right? The ulum al-sadaf, as he calls it, the outward sort of basic meanings of the Qur'an. He says, dive into the ocean, right? Dive into the oceans of its meanings, because the Qur'an is the bahar, the Qur'an is the ocean. At the bottom of the ocean, you have to work hard, you have to have tadabbur, when you get to the bottom of the ocean, you find these pearls and these rubies, these precious stones, these jawahir and lubab, as he calls them. So here's Ayatul Kursi, a masterpiece of Semitic rhetoric, another chiastic parallelism, mirror composition, ajib, at the level of an ayah. Look at this here. You see the top statement, A, and then look at A prime at the bottom. Look at the relationship between these two statements. Allahu la ilaha illahu al hayyu al qayyum wa huwa al aliyu al azim. You see? Huwa, you have the divine name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala followed by two of his names, two of his great names, al hayyu al qayyum and al aliyu al azim. So these verses, they complement each other. Look at B and B prime, not seizing him. Our, slum, our slumber nor sleep. Look at B prime. And not burdening him is a preservation of them both. So these two verses, what are they doing? They're negating. They're negating anything that is potentially inappropriate for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And maintaining his qudra, mutlaq, his absolute power. So these verses have a semantical relationship. These statements, they're not verses, they're statements within a verse. 
Look at C in C prime. Lahu ma fi samawat wa ma fi al To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and whatever is on earth. Look at C prime. Wa si al kursi hu samawati wa al Repetition. The Quran repeats itself, not for just no reason. There's a great wisdom behind the repetition in the Quran. Something's happening here. There's a parallelism. To him belongs whatever is in the heavens and the earth. That means Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns everything. We own nothing. We don't own our houses. We don't own your clothes. We don't own our bodies. We have autonomy over nothing. My body, my choice. No. You don't have a body. You don't own your body. Your body is on loan from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Whenever he wants, he can take it back. But we have nothing to say about it. Everything is owned by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wasiya kursi wa His throne extends over the heavens and the earth. And there is a throne from the majestic creations of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Imam al Razi mentions, but there's other meanings here. The throne is the seat of a king, which again demonstrates Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's absolute ownership of the entire universe. The samawat and the ard is an idiom in Arabic, which means the cosmos, the entire creation. Al alamin. What is al alamin? Kulu ma siwa Allah. Everything except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then look at this. In the center, ah, in the center, I forgot to mention this. In the center of Kothar, this is called the, uh, the Amud. So Al Farahi and Al Islahi, they call this the Amud. This is the center of the chiasm, which is something that is more sort of universal, that applies to the Ummah. Right? So the first and the third, this is speaking directly to the Prophet. So in this ayah too in the middle, but there's there's a sort of transcendental quality to the focus of the chiasm. So pray to your Lord and sacrifice. This is sort of the pivot around which the surah turns. And here, the pivot itself is also a circle. It's ajib. So you have symmetry within symmetry. Keep in mind the Prophet is not writing anything down. Right? He's simply repeating these ayat that he's hearing from Jibreel alayhi salam. And for him to do something like this, even at this level, means he's a genius. But we're going to see different levels. This is a micro level. We'll see the macro level. But look at within the actual center of the chiasm. What happens? What changes? So A, B, C, and C, B, A are describing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In the middle, there's a change, a type of guilty fat a type of thematic iltifat. So there's iltifat of tense, you know, you know, past tense, present tense, of person, like that, first person, the third person. But here the theme changes. Now creation is brought in. Man illa Who amongst creation can intercede with him except with his permission? And then look at A prime. Except with his permission, except what he wills, his repetition. These two statements parallel each other. So, right in the middle of the middle, the middle of the middle of the ayah, the ilm, the knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He knows what is before them and behind them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows everything about us. And this is consolation. Allah knows everything. You know, sometimes we kill ourselves trying to please humanity, please creation. But, you know, it lasts for 15 minutes and it's done. But who's going to remember us in our graves? Long after we're dead, maybe our headstones will, you know, will be destroyed at some point. No one, no one even knows where we are. But who knows us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Put all of our hope in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So this is a book recommendation here. This is by a Belgian priest, actually, <clears throat> uh, named Michel Kuypers. Uh, he's a man. Michel is a, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a name for a man in Europe, apparently. So the composition of the Quran. 
It's true that through assiduous reading and textual analysis, the exceptionally complex and erudite character of this text has become more evident to us. We hope to have demonstrated that in spite of the impression a superficial reading might leave, the Quran is a text whose parts are linked according to clearly definable principles of order and a consummate work of art, even though it is outside our Western and modern mental habits. So, you know, the non-Muslim scholars, the sort of neo-Orientalists, they're starting to come around. You know, in more advanced studies in the Quran, they're starting to see that this Quran is more than meets the eye. We would completely misjudge the Quran. Our initial first reading of the Quran through our sort of biblical lenses, as it were, our Greek lenses, didn't help us. So here is the entire Surah Yusuf. This is 111 ayat. Chiastic compositional symmetry at the level of a surah. Prologue, epilogue. Vision of Joseph, accomplishment of the vision. Problem of Joseph's brothers, trickery of brothers with Joseph. Joseph, problems of Joseph with brothers, trickery of Joseph. Relative promotion of Joseph, definitive promotion of Joseph. Attempted seduction of Joseph. Denouncement of the, of the seduction of the woman. Joseph in prison, interpreter of two visions. Joseph in prison interprets the vision of the king. And then you have this center. And the center of Surah Yusuf, of Surah Yusuf itself is circular. Again, you have, you have concentricity within concentricity, symmetry within symmetry. If you're not writing this down, and you're not playing with things over hundreds of pages of rough drafts. There's no way you can do this unless you have a 400 IQ. Right in the middle, oh my fellow prisoners, this is the center of the surah, Tawheed. Very interesting. This story is in Genesis, in the Torah, and it's very detailed. But there's one something missing. There's one thing missing <laughs> from Genesis is the is the center in the Quran. When Yusuf السلام, according to the Torah is in prison and his cellmates tell him the dream, he immediately interprets the dream because the text in Genesis is very tribal. We are Bani Israel. Right? But the Quran's message is more universal. It's calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So there's this nice addition here in the Quran. Very interesting that 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 Tawheed, that Yusuf السلام, before he interprets the dreams of his cellmates, he makes da'wah to them. Because he's a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this deen is for humanity. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commissioned the Musa alayhi salam, it's a bit different than what we find in the Torah. Go to Pharaoh and say, let my people go. They're my people, this type of thing. That's the Torah. In the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, say to Fir'aun, Say to him a gentle word. Perhaps he might fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Call him to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is missing in the biblical narrative. These subtle differences, a critical rewrite, if you will, demonstrates the beauty, the eloquence, the universality of the message given to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is rahmatu lil alameen. There's another, this is a, Cutting edge Western scholarship. I, like I said, they're starting to come around a little bit. This is a Berkeley, UC Berkeley scholar. The verse of the Quran, and he's, he's quoting here, Qadi Abu Bakr ibn Arabi. And these things are known by our scholars. Imam al Razi, he calls this the Munasabat of the Quran. Imam al Alusi mentioned these things. Right. Imam ibn Umar al Biqa'i mentioned these things. How the verses, how they're symmetrical, how, how the surahs, right? Uh, how they follow each other in some sort of coherence, nidam. They mention these things. You have modern day scholars, Hamiduddin al Farahi, in his Nidam al Quran, mentions this. And in Ahsan al Islahi, Tadabur al Quran in Urdu, which is being translated into English, is fantastic, unbelievable. The verses of the Quran are joined together in such a manner that they are like a single word, harmoniously associated, structurally even. Ibn Hisham said the Quran is like a jumla wahida, it's like a single coherent statement. 
Now this is the, this is incredible. This is a Baqarah. <laughs> Surah Al-Baqarah, 286 verses. A staggering, sophisticated chiasm. Verses that surround a central pivot. What is the pivot? What is the center of the surah? Verses 142 to 152. This is the sort of the central ideas of the surah. So you have A and A prime, faith versus the, the unbelief, iman and kufr, B and B prime, Allah's creation, C and C prime, deliverance of law, D and D prime, being tested. Now notice how was the Quran revealed to the Prophet? It wasn't revealed, Fatiha, you're done. Baqara, you're done. Ali Imran, you're done. That's the canonical order. That's not how it was revealed to the Prophet. That's how he arranged it with Jibir alayhi salam. So when he's receiving Quran, he's receiving a few ayahs, put this in Al Ma'idah, put this in Al Nisa, put this in Ali Imran. And you look at the end, the final composition of these surahs, and you find something like this without him writing something down. Impossible. I guarantee you. This is impossible because every surah is like this. There's a symmetry to all these surahs. Like I mentioned, Kaifer, as I talked about earlier, he wrote a book called The Banquet, a compositional study of Surah Al Ma'idah. He says you find this in Surah Al Ma'idah. And Nabi Al Ummi, an unlettered prophet, able to produce something like this. This is a wahi. There's no doubt about it. There's no way you can do this without writing things, without a computer, even with a computer. You'll be hard for us to do something like this. So what is at the heart of Al-Baqarah? Ah, seven ideas. Verses 142 to 152, the change of the Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca. That does not mean that Jerusalem is not important. It's still important. People say, oh, it's replaced, it's no one. No, Al-Quds, still important. Right? But there's a change from the Qibla, from Jerusalem to Mecca. The close relationship between Allah and His Messenger, and the Messenger with us, we see you looking at the heavens, looking at the sky. The Prophet ﷺ in dua, he just went like this, he looked at the sky. We will turn you to a qibla that pleases you. The Prophet ﷺ looked to the sky, in his heart he had a dua. I wish the qibla was Mecca. Allah revealed the ayah. Turn your face towards the inviolable mosque in Mecca. So it went from wajhika to wujuhakum. It went from turn your face without skipping a beat to turn your faces. So who is Allah addressing now? So he's addressing the Prophet Wajhika, Kafa Fitab, second person, masculine, singular. But who is wujuhakum? Who is it? The Ummah of the Prophet So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes from addressing the Prophet immediately to addressing the Ummah of the Prophet as a way of tashrif, as a way of honoring the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad The Muslims are a middle nation. What verse is this? 143. Out of what? 286. Ummatan wasata. Wasat. You are a middle nation. It's just coincidence, apparently. <laughs> the people of the book that recognize the Prophet, recognition means they already knew him. That's that's what Arafa Ya'rifu Ma'rifa means means to recognize something you already knew. Like, oh I know him. Huh. When he came into Medina, Araftu Anna Wajahu Laysabi Wajikata Araftu. Abdullah ibn Salam, a Jewish scholar. I recognized his face. It's not the face of a liar. Why? Because his description is in their books. They know him like they know one of their own sons. In Sahih al-Bukhari, we read that the Jews would sit, Nabi They would sneeze on purpose. Uh, they would sneeze on purpose in hopes that the Prophet would say to them, May Allah have mercy on you, because they knew he was a prophet. But they would remain Jews. And maybe there was some you know, family pressure and things like that. You know, maybe some of them. But the Prophet, when that would happen, he would say, Allahu yahdikum. 
Allah guide you and correct your understanding. Fear only Allah. The blessing of the Prophet Again, this is the center of Al-Baqarah. Everything else sort of revolves around these themes. It's all wahi. It's all equally important. Right? Because it's all wahi. But these are the central ideas. The blessing of the Prophet. The Prophet teaches us, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the kitab and hikmah. And hikmah is the sunnah. Wa sunnah, a sunnah to fasil al-Qur'an. The sunnah exegetes the Qur'an. And tazkiyah. And he purifies you. Ihsan. He gives you uh, knowledge as to how to become dear and near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is ihsan. To worship Allah as though you see Him. And if you can't see Him, know that He sees you. To enter into a relationship of love with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To ski it to nafs. To draw out the diseases of the hearts. And Imam al-Ghazali says, these are the durar. These are the pearls we talked about earlier. There's verses in the Quran he calls the pearls. They teach you the straight path. In part and parcel to the path, he says, is takhliya. Takhliya means a type of emptying the nafs of vice, of kibir, of riya, of ujub, all of these diseases of the heart. The Quran tells us how to do this. The Sunnah tells us how to do this. And then he says there's tahliya. There's a way of adorning the nafs. So first you purge the nafs of vice, and then you take on prophetic qualities, the qualities of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi Oh, this is a, just, it's again, some of the ta'if, some really interesting subtleties. Just let me know when I'm out of time. If anyone has questions, you can ask them immediately. Does anyone have any questions? Okay, we'll keep going then. So the Exodus. So in, in the Torah, we have the Hijrah of Musa alayhi salam and Bani Israel. We have this in the Quran as well. But historical plausibility. One of the reasons why most secular historians reject the biblical version of the Exodus is because of historical implausibilities in the narrative. Okay, what do I mean by historical implausibilities? So, so secular historians, the modern historians, they make a distinction between something that is non-historical, non-historical like a miracle. They don't deal with miracles, they don't deal with the supernatural. They don't necessarily deny them. But miracles are, by definition, the least plausible occurrence of something, right? So that's not how they do history. They're looking, everything is plausibility, naturalistic plausibility. So let's say, for example, a miracle might have happened, but it's not part of our paradigm. We're not going to look at it. It's non-historical. We just don't deal with it. It doesn't factor in to our theory. But something that is making a naturalistic claim, something that's making a naturalistic claim, and there's very little evidence of it, this is unhistorical. They would call that unhistorical. So look at this verse here in Exodus 12, 7, 12, 37. This is from the Torah. The Israelites' journey, etc. 600,000 men on foot, beside women and children. That means there's 3 million people making Exodus. 3 million people, according to the Torah, making Exodus is a third of the population of Egypt. Highly implausible. Other nations would have noticed this. They would have recorded this. There would have been a large carbon footprint in the Sinai Desert. To this day, we can find evidence of this. Three million people, right? If you, somebody told me once, if, if 10 people were marching, 10 people across, the first in rows, 10 people across, three million people. When the first row reached Mount Sinai, the last row was still in Egypt. So these numbers are blown way out of proportion. So the Quran confirms the Exodus, but look at the subtlety in the Quran, is ajib. You know the common Orientalist trope? The Prophet is just copying the Bible. Why doesn't he copy the mistakes? And we reveal to Moses, journey by night with my servants, you'll be pursued. And Pharaoh sent mobilizers to all cities. Saying, indeed, these are a small band. How many people made hijrah from the Sahaba of the Prophet? It wasn't a big group, a few hundred people. Interesting. The Quran avoids, and this happens consistently. We'll see more examples. The Quran consistently avoids historical implausibilities that are found in the biblical narrative.
Aha. Uh -huh. There's an anachronism in the book of Genesis. Here's something interesting. You can ask an Egyptologist, because I did. The kings, sorry, the rulers of Egypt, ancient Egypt, they were not called Pharaoh until the 18th dynasty. This is just a fact. There's no evidence that the rulers of Egypt were called Pharaoh prior to the 18th dynasty. Okay? When did Yusuf salam live in Egypt? Probably the 16th dynasty. 16. Right after the Hyksos. Now look at this verse here highlighted. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, Ah, that's an anachronism. The kings of Egypt were not called Pharaoh at the time of Joseph. You know what anachronism is? Something that doesn't make sense historically. Something that's outside, you know, like you watch a movie about like the Middle Ages and you see a guy wearing a Rolex. You say, whoa, that's called an anachronism. If I told you Abraham Lincoln had a Tesla. Mashallah, there's a lot of Teslas in the parking lot. Why do the Teslas always go in the trunk first? I, I did you notice that? So it's always a Tesla. Why do you guys do that? Anyway. Because you have a Tesla. <laughs> you, you've earned the right, mashallah. Again, the Quran here, this is Mm. The king said to Yusuf alayhi salam, the medic, not Fir'aun. Uh, but you read later in the Quran, what does Allah say to Musa, who's in the 18th dynasty or 19th dynasty? Idhab ila Fir'aun, innahu taqaw. Ajee. Falyoma nunajika bi badanika li takuna li man khalfaka ayah. Wa inna kathina min al nasi an ayatina ghafilun. This is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to Fir'aun. Today we will save your body. Now, how did the classical exegetes, Mufassir in the Quran, how did they interpret this verse? And this is a correct interpretation. Is that the, the body of Pharaoh sort of washed up on shore, and the Bani Israel, they saw it. They had like sort of this Ain al yaqeen that the Pharaoh was dead. But interestingly, this Pharaoh, who's either Ramses II, or Tutmos III, in my opinion, Tutmos III. Both of these bodies were discovered in the 19th century. And they're on display right now at Cairo Museum. One of my friends who's a bit eccentric, he visited the Cairo Museum. And he was introduced to Ramses II. The tour guide said, this is the Fir'aun of the Exodus. And so the group left, and then my friend went back and he leaned over and he said, where are you at now? <laughs> we'll save your body so that you might be a sign for those who come after you. But many people concerning these signs are heathens. Ajib. Ah, masterful symmetry in wordplay. Surah Maryam. Kafa ya'in sa'i. Look at this verse, number two. Very short. The mention of the mercy of your Lord to his servant Zechariah. Did you know the words Zikr and Zachariah? This is a Hebrew prophet's name. It's a Hebrew name. Zachariah, Zakar, comes from the same, it's the it's exact cognate of Zikr. And it means, the, it means the mention of the Lord. The mention of the mercy of your Lord to his servant, the mention of the Lord. You see the symmetry in this ayah. If a, a Jew who speaks Arabic in the Hijaz, or if we should say, you know, or an Arab speaks Hebrew in the Hijaz, if he heard this verse, it's very stunning, the symmetry. It's very eloquent. It's very beautiful. But these things are lost. These subtleties are lost. So you see the chiasm. Even this verse, in the center is what? To his servant, Ubudiyah. This is at the center of these three suwah. Surah Al-Isra, how does it begin? Subhanallah ladhi asra bi abdi. Surah Al-Kahf, alhamdulillahi ladhi anzana ala abdihi al-kitaba wa lam yaj'al lahu iwaja. Surah Maryam, kafa ya inzar, dhikru rahmati rabbika abdahu zakariya. And we said that even the surah itself is a big sort of Symmetrical structure. At the very end of Surah Maryam, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala say? 
وقالوا اتخذ الرحمن ولدا لقد جئتم شيئا إدا تكاد السماوات يتفكرن منه وتنشق الأرض وتخذ الجبال هكا أن دعوا للرحمن ولدا وما ينبغي للرحمن أن يتخذ ولدا إن كل من في السماوات والأرض إلا آتي الرحمن عبدا towards the very end of the surah and then in the middle of the surah what does Isa alayhi salam say? Inni abdullah. So beginning, middle, end. What's that? Creed translation. Yes, yes. I thought you said keep fasting. I was like, no, I'm not going. I'm going. Yes, I'm sure. So, sorry. At the end of Surah Maryam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has begotten a son. They brought forth something monstrous. At it, the heavens are about to burst and the mountains are about to be rent asunder and the earth is about to be split open that they should invoke a son for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, it is not, it is not um, befitting for the most gracious to beget a son. Everything in the heavens and the earth only approaches Allah as a servant. And this is a great honor as a servant. When the Prophet وسلم, when he heard the verses of the Quran, Ibn Mas'ud would recite the Quran to him. He would tell Ibn Mas'ud, Iqra alayh, like, read the Quran to me. And he says, reveal to you, you want me to recite it? Yeah, I love hearing it from other than me. Recite it, Ibn Mas'ud would recite. And every time the word Abd would come and reference the Prophet, Ibn Mas'ud saw those tears coming from the face of the Prophet This is a great title. Inni Abdullah, Isa alayhi salam, I am a servant of God. This is the center of Surah Maryam. I am the servant of God. He's given me the book of wisdom and made me a prophet. More masterful wordplay. Uh -huh. This is Surah Hud. You get it? It's very stunning. It's very eloquent. It's very clever. And his wife, Sarah, was standing and she laughed. So he gave her yikshak, which in Hebrew means laughter. And following after Isaac, ya'akov, which means to follow after. So whoever composed this verse, we know it's Allah. I'm speaking in sort of dramatic terms. Whoever composed this verse was a master of Hebrew and Arabic and was a master composer in both languages. This is why the Orientalists that don't like Islam are scratching their heads. It must have been a committee. But when? When? Good luck. Ah. Uh -huh. About Yahya alayhi salam. What does Allah say about Yahya alayhi salam? Did I miss something here? Allah said. Okay. Yeah, that's fine. See this word Hananan in red in the Arabic? It means compassion. Hananan. This is a hapax. This is the only occurrence of this word in the entire Quran and it's describing Yahya alayhi salam. The Quran calls him Yahya because he was a shaheed, right? Uh, don't say about the shaheeds that they're amwat, amwatun, bal ahya'un, inda rabbihim yurzakun. They're alive, get, getting sustenance from their Lord. But the name of John in Hebrew is Yohanan. Yohanan means the Lord has shown Hanan. The Lord has shown compassion. Ajib. This is the only occurrence of this word in the Quran, and it's describing Yahya alayhi salam, whose name is related to this word. There's just a coincidence, apparently. Coincidence? I think not. Whoever composed this knew Arabic and Hebrew, is a master composer. And strive for God as you have to strive. He chose you and did not impose upon you difficulties in the religion. It is a creed of your father, Abraham. What does Abraham mean? Abraham, father of many nations. 
more wordplay, adding to the eloquence, the inimitability of the Quran, the fact that the Quran is insuperable. Scathing wordplay, double entendres. <laughs> Here's, these are two famous verses from the Torah. So the Israelites, they said to God, we hear and we obey. We hear and we obey. This is what that sounds like in Hebrew. Shema'anu wa'asimu. Shema'anu wa'asimu. We hear and we obey. Okay? And then, in Exodus, and he, Moses, took the calf the people had made and burned it with fire, and he ground it to powder. He scattered it on the water and made the Israelites drink it. So it's a very interesting story in Exodus. According to Exodus, the golden calf was melted down put into water, and the Israelites had to drink it. It's called a trial by ordeal. And whoever drank it and was innocent, nothing would happen to their body. But if you're guilty, something would happen to your body. And that's how the people knew that these were the people who instigated the shirk of the ijin, of the golden calf. In one verse, look at Allah, what he says. قَالُوا سَمِعْنَا وَعَصِينَا شَمِعْنَا وَعَصِينَا You see? So this, this statement here, is clearly a play on Deuteronomy 5.27. It sounds almost exactly like we hear it, we obey, but it has the opposite meaning. Because Allah is telling him, you said that, but this is what actually happened. It's very clever. It's very scathing. <laughs> to drink something into your heart is an Arabic expression. It means to like become devoted to something. But there's a double entendre here. Because the Torah actually says they literally drank the calf. Well, this one here, yeah, this is... So this is a verse that's often attacked by people, like secular people and Christians, they attack this verse, because this verse denies the crucifixion of Isa alayhi salam. But if you actually look at what this verse says, it's very interesting. By the way, what's up on top is not a translation. That's a, that's a different verse. Allah will, this is just sort of the theme. Allah will demonstrate the truth of his words, even though the sinners might detest it. So this verse says, And indeed, they said, We killed the Christ, Jesus, son of Mary, the messenger of God, but in fact they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but it was made to appear so that they had. And indeed, those who differ over him are full of doubt about it. They have no certain knowledge, but follow conjecture. For surety, they killed him not. So, differ. Ikhtilaf. <laughs> Right? Ikhtilaf means there's a difference of opinion. If you read the earliest books of the New Testament, I don't want to get too much into this because it's, it's probably going to be boring, but the first books of the New Testament ever written were the letters of Paul. It's before the Gospels. And a central theme in Paul's letters is that there are people that have ikhtilaf about the crucifixion. He calls it Eris. In Greek, Eris is the goddess of strife. But it's also the word for fitna and ikhtilaf. Full of doubt. Shak. Shak means it can go either way. It's kind of 50 50. You have one group of Christians saying he was, another group maybe saying he's not. You have one ta'ifa, as the Quran says, who, who believed in Isa, and another ta'ifa who disbelieved in him. And then you have, uh, you have dhan. So dhan is when there's a lot of evidence. So there seems to be a preponderance of plausibility, but there's no certitude. In other words, a lot of Christians are saying that he was crucified, right? But there's nothing, there's no ilm. It's not, it's not certain. This is a verse from the, from the Psalms that David wrote this. It's very interesting. God saves his Messiah. Psalm 26, it says very clearly, this is in the Bible, the book of Psalms, the Zabur, some, some ulama say this is the Zabur, God saves his Messiah. Interestingly, Jesus is the same name as Jeshua. It's the same name. If you read a, a, an English Bible, you read about someone in the Old Testament called Jeshua. It's a very common name, Jeshua. That's also, that's actually Jesus' real name, Jeshua. But when you read a translation in English, it's, it's a different name. One says Jeshua, one says Jesus. But in Hebrew, it's the same name, Yeshua. You see down at the bottom here? This is a Christian source. How do they define Yeshua? Jesus' name. 
What does it say? He is saved. Savior? No. He is saved. Yeshua means the one that God saved. And this is just, you know, this is kind of just more evidence. There are no eyewitnesses. Nothing we have was written by an eyewitness. Nothing that the Christians claim uh, that that describes a crucifixion was written by an eyewitness. This, these are things that were discovered in the last few centuries. Like when this ayah was revealed to the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina, that he wasn't crucified, no doubt the Christians were saying, but we have the Gospels and two of them are written by eyewitnesses and they saw the crucifixion. Nobody really believes that anymore. There's not a single historian, and, and many of them are Christian, that believes that these books are written by eyewitnesses. So I'll, I'll spare you the details of this one. But, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll end with this one, inshallah. So this is something amazing here. Right. So I want to sort of revisit some of these ayat in uh, Surah Al-Isra in light of modern historical developments. And the reason is because this will really demonstrate the Quran's ability to accurately predict future events. And there's some students here that who got this part yesterday in apologetics class. And by the way, this is not my personal tosia. I'm not qualified to give tosia. <laughs> you have to have mastered something 12, 13, even Jusea Kalbi says like 15 sacred sciences in order to give your opinion about something in the Quran. So this is a tafsir of modern ulama in light of recent history, right? Those who have traditional training, in the various requisite disciplines. So the Quran's semantical polyvalence allows for multiple correct interpretations. In other words, the Quran's ability to communicate meaning at different levels. Okay. So Surah Al-Isra is also called Surah Bani Israel. So listen to what Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says. We'll just look at the first eight verses and then verse one hundred four, and then we'll be done. Inshallah. سبحان الذي أسرى بعبده ليلا من المسجد الحرام إلى المسجد الأقصى الذي باركنا حوله لنوريه من آياتنا إنه هو السميع البصير. Glory be to the one who took his servant on a night journey from the inviolable mosque in Mecca to the Al-Aqsa Mosque, Masjid Al-Aqsa in Jerusalem. His precincts we did bless in order to show him some of our signs. Indeed, he is hearing and seeing. وأتينا موسى الكتاب وجعلنا هدى لبني إسرائيل ألا تتخذوا من دون وكيلا we gave Moses a revelation and made it a guidance for the children of Israel, stating, do not take other than me as a disposer of your affairs. O progeny of those whom we carried in the ark. Indeed, he, Noah, was a grateful servant. And we decreed for the children of Israel in the revelation. So this could be the, the aforementioned kitab, the Torah, or some ulama say in the lowah mahfuf, in the preserved tablet. You will certainly cause great corruption in the earth twice, and you will become extremely arrogant, oppressive, while in a state of political power, right? So ulu means to be in power. In the Fir'aun ala Fir'aud, right? جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْأُولَاهُمَا بَعَثْنَا عَلَيْكُمْ عِبَادًا لَنَا وَلِبَأْسٍ شَدِيدٍ فَجَاسُوا خِيَالَ الْتِيَارِ وَكَانَ وَعْدًا مَثْهُولًا So the promise of the first of the two came to pass, right? So like the end of the first ulur. We sent against you our servants of great might who ravaged your homes. That was a promise fulfilled. So the end here, وَكَانَ وَعَدًا مَفْعُولًا means this is in the past. This is done. This is something that happened in the past. There's no doubt about it. So the ulama mentioned here, so when Bani Israel came into power with David, 1000 BCE, when did they lose power? What, what was the end of their, their ulur? It was in 586 BCE. 
And the Babylonians attacked the southern kingdom of Judah. They killed the last Davidic king. They cut off David, basically. Everyone was brought into captivity in Babylon. And they entered the homes of the Israelites, just like the Quran says. And they pulled people out that were sort of the more sort of influential people. And they took them as prisoner into Babylon. Now, this verse, number six, sorry. This verse, according to several exegetes, the khitab changes here. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing the Muslims in the form of a prophecy. This is the, is the future. Then we will give you, O Muslims, the upper hand over them and aid you with wealth and offspring and make you greater in number. This is a prophecy. The Bani Israel will never greater the number than anybody. We will give you power over them, over Bani Israel. The Jerusalem was conquered shortly after, during the Caliphate, during the Caliphate Sayyidina Umar, radiallahu anhu. And the, the Muslims, they conquered the Babylonian lands, the Persian lands, the Byzantine lands. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the Muslims, in ahsantum, ahsantum li anfusikum. If you do well, then you do well for yourselves. Wa in asa'tum falaha. But if you do wrong, it is your own loss. فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ لِيَسُوءُوا لِيَسُوءُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ لِيَسُوءُوا وَجُوهَكُمْ then when the promise of the final of the two ulur will come to pass, this is the future, they, meaning the Jews, will disgrace you, humiliate you. And they'll enter the Al-Aqsa Mosque. What is Al-Masjid here? Well, what was the last mention of the mosque? The word masjid, what was the last mention of? What's the referent? That's the rule. Subhanahu the aswa bi'adhi layla min masjid al-haram ila masjid al-Aqsa. And they will enter the Aqsa Mosque, like they did during the first time, during their first uh, ruling, during the first ulur. And they, meaning the Jews, Bani Israel, will destroy with utter destruction. Perhaps, perhaps your Lord will have mercy on you. So here, asa in Arabic is called fi'lu taraji. Right? It's a fear, it's a verb of, of hope. Right? In other words, this will happen. Okay? God will have mercy on you, on the Muslims. But it's going to be after, after some tests. Right? In the same surah, asa wa min al-layli fatahajjad bihi. Right? So, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying to the Prophet in the night make tahajjud, it's an addition for you. Perhaps your Lord will raise you to the praiseworthy station. Right? And he has a maqam mahmud. This is a, a cause of hope. But if you return to sin, we will return to punishment. You know, after the Ghazwat or Hud. Some of them said, what? How did this happen? Who am in India and This is the response from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is from yourselves. And we made hell a confinement for the disbelievers. Strong warning to future generations. So like, think about this. How much have the Palestinians suffered for the injustices committed by others? How much have the people of Gaza in particular suffered for the injustices committed by others? They inherited the consequences of the bad decisions of non-Muslims of course, but also Muslims. Bad decisions, bad alliances, nationalism, Arab nationalism, Turkish nationalism, secularism, disunity, rebellion against the caliphate, making alliances with the Kofar, Young Turks Revolution, McMahon Hussein correspondence. But the victory will come. This is a promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not going to be easy. Perhaps your Lord will have mercy on you. But if you return to sin, we will return to our punishments. Now, towards the end of the surah, remember how we said these surahs, they have this kind of circular theme. 
towards the end of the surah, we have this phrase again, Wa'adu al-akhira. And some of the ulama say, it's talking about the afterlife. But in light of what we know here, there's no reason to say that this is talking about the afterlife. وَقُلْنَا مِنْ بَعْدِهِ لِبَانِ إِسْرَائِيلِ أُسْكُنُ فِي الْأَرْضِ فَإِذَا جَاءَ فَإِذَا جَاءَ وَعْدُ الْآخِرَةِ جِئْنَا بِكُمْ لَفِيفًا And we said to the children of Israel after that, dwell in the earth, in diaspora, right? And when the promise of the final of the two ulur will come to pass, we will bring you to the Holy Land as a mixed assembly. So the Jews from all over the world will flood into the Holy Land. This is the modern Zionist movement. This is the second ulur. This is the major indication of their second facade in the earth. Then what will they do? According to the Quran, they will oppress the Muslims. And they will enter Masjid al-Aqsa. And they will absolutely destroy Palestine. And it seems that these sort of... Well, anyway, we won't get to that point. Did this, like... So from, this is my finish here. So from our perspective, eventually the pseudo-Messiah, the Messiah the Dajjal, will emerge. Isa alayhi salam, the true Messiah, will re-emerge. Isa alayhi salam will defeat the pseudo-Messiah and punish the Ahid Kitab, you know, there in the Holy Land, but also guide many of them. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will gather them there as a lafifa, a mixed assembly, from all of the Ashkenazi Jews, Sephardic Jews, Mizrahi Jews, gather them there as a mixed assembly for Isa alayhi salam to call them to Islam. And then eventually, every Jew and Christian will become Muslim before the death of Isa alayhi salam. This is what the Quran says. Right? وَإِمِّنْ أَهْلِ الْكِتَابِ إِلَّا لِيُؤْمِنَنَّ بِهِ قَبْلَ مَوْتِهِ And the pronoun here, according to most of the exegetes, is referring to Isa alayhi salam. And there is none of the people of the book that will believe in him before his death. Okay. So, very interesting. You see the Qur'an. It never ceases to be a relevant text. As we move through life, century after century, we go back to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And these incredible meanings come out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere. But the way the Qur'an is written is such that these interpretations make total sense. You're not, we're not stretching the text. The Christians, they do that, like the book of Revelation, you know, something called the dragon, the dragon, the beast, the mother of harlots, the four horsemen. What on earth is going on? You can interpret these things nine ways to Sunday. Who knows what's happening? Here? The beast, 666, okay, well, what? you got to do a lot of pushing and pulling with the text. And so a lot of Christians, in all due respect to them, they, they do something called, I call it hermeneutical waterboarding. You know, so if you, if you torture a text, you, you choke a text long enough, it eventually to say whatever he wanted to say, right? <laughs> anyway, JazakAllah khairan. Are there any questions? I've spoken too much now. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Adelaide. So uh, those that are watching online, go ahead and uh, type your chat, uh, your questions in the chat box. A lot of people from around the world watching. Uh, those that are in the room, just raise your hand. I'll come over to the mic. Raise your hand, please. Good luck with the mic getting to you, though. Oh, mashallah. So thorough, Dr. Adelaide. I think it's very late, actually. People looking at the world. Hey, I'm going to stop talking. I've got to get to my Tesla. <laughs> We have one brave soul right here. So, I'm not bitter. <laughs> yes, sir. Salam alaikum. Wa alaikum salam. So every century, as you mentioned, uh, we have ref these. The same Quran is has been relevant, is relevant, and will be relevant. So how do we conject, come to the point that this is this surah or this ayah is relevant to me at this point of time, versus saying this is relevant? to, in, from historical point of view, or this ayah is relevant, not necessarily to me, but in the future. How do we make sense of that or, or come to the conclusion? Yeah, we, we have to be in touch with ulama. This is very important. The downfall of the previous ummah uh, is that they didn't preserve their language, number one, right? As the Quran says um, in Al-Baqarah, the verses are, um, 
escaping me. Ibn Abbas says, one of the downfalls of Bani Israel is they did not uh, preserve their, their language. And then many of them cut themselves off from their scholars. And many of their scholars were also corrupt. So always have some sort of connection with scholars. This is extremely important, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu he told us, We live in an age right now where scholars are being, you know, people are attacking them, they're making up these outlandish, crazy things about them, lying about them, slander, buhtan, right, these types of things. They want to decentralize Islam because they don't like this normative tradition because the normative tradition, that is to say, what the Quran and Sunnah say on its surface is very powerful. And people see this as a threat. So you, decentral, you, you attack the scholars, you decentralize the religion, so that my opinion is just as good as anyone else's opinion. So whatever I say on my comment on, on Twitter, or I don't have Twitter, but whatever I tweet, what comment I make on YouTube, it's just as good as Shaykh al-Islam. Why not? I got a brain, you know? أَكْرِمُ الْعُلَمَا فَإِنَّهُمْ وَرَثَةُ الْأَنْبِيَاءِ فَمَنْ أَكْرَمَهُمْ فَقَدْ أَكْرَمَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولَهُ Honor the scholars. They are the inheritors of the prophets. Whoever honors the scholars has honored Allah and His Messenger. So we should always have recourse to ulama. This is very important. Don't isolate yourself. Don't put yourself on an island. You know, they say a little bit of knowledge is dangerous. Right? You have people that are very brilliant, the autodidactics, people that you know can you know teach themselves Arabic and they can you know do these online things and learn hadith and fit and these things. But this is a dangerous. This this is not a traditional way of study. The traditional way of study is to sit sit at the feet of a scholar. Take knowledge directly. It's talaqi. There's sana. These things are very, very important. That, that Adam took something from Allah. What was? What did he take from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? According to the hadith, that he said, Oh Allah, forgive me for the sake of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. These, were, these words were taught to him directly by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So talaqi knowledge. Very, very important. Ijaza, you know, teaching licenses. This is a problem with Paul of Tarsus. Again, I, I don't want to pick on the Christians too much. Paul has no ijaza. He has no connection to the Hawariyun. He's the first person in history to say Jesus was crucified. And his son that ends at him. And he says it himself. He said, nobody taught me this. I, I, I got this as a revelation from Jesus. And then he really butts heads with actual disciples. Right? But if you look at the Injil, according to the Quran, it's almost perfectly in line, according to most historians, with what the original disciples would have actually preached. So that's a, that's a wahi, but historically there's a connection. Right? But Paul's senate ends with him. He has no senate. He admits it. He says, I don't need one. In, in 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, the people in Corinth, they say, where is your letter of recommendation, your ijazah from James the Just? He says, I don't need it. I had a vision of Christ, and... I have stigmata, my hands are bleeding, these types of things. Okay. So, you know, ask questions. It, it, there's nothing wrong with asking questions. You know, in the Quran, Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim alayhi salam, who has more iman than all of us put together in this room, he said to Allah, how is it that you raise the dead? Allah said to him, do you not believe? Allah knows the answer. He said, of course I believe, but for the itminan of my qalb, I want to have certitude in my heart. I want to have tranquility in my heart. That's a good type of question. In other words, it's coming from a place of conviction in Imam. I want to have a deeper understanding. Right? But the type of questioning that is reprehensible is Allah says, do this. Sacrifice a bakara. <laughs> well, what's, what's a bakara? Okay, what color is it? Oh, really? Oh, how old? Really? Well, what day? Okay. Do what you're commanded. So a type of questioning coming from a place of rebellion. This is something that's reprehensible. But questioning coming from a place of wanting to know at a deeper level of understanding. This is totally fine. And no scholar should be offended by it. So we have, mashallah, we have ulama in this room, not me, sitting over here. We have to have connection with them. Can you hear me? Okay, thank yeah. you. Um, and 
in light of this conversation, there's a lot of talk in regards to this red cow and the sacrifice. I knew it would come up. I mean, yes, it's very can, important. Can we? Can you please enlighten us with your perspective? <coughs> Thank you. Ooh. Sorry. Sorry about that. Yes, I was going to talk about it, and then I decided to skip it because people they hear about this and they think this is some weird. This is like some conspiracy stuff, right? But it's not. It's very real and it's very important. So this is called the red cow. Is called the para aduma in the Torah, in Jewish tradition, the para aduma. So it says in the book of Numbers, the fourth book of the Torah, Numbers chapter 19, that in order for there to be a priesthood and therefore a temple, uh, the priests have to purify themselves with the ashes of a between two and three year old perfect red heifer. So they have to sacrifice this red heifer and then they sort of, mm -hmm. they take the ashes and they purify, they do some sort of ritual where they purify the priests and their vestments and, and sort of the instruments of the temple. There's only been nine in their entire history, by the way. It's very difficult to get a perfect red heifer. Perfect meaning completely red, no black or white hairs ever. Even, even red hooves, no uh, saddle, no yoke, it's never given birth, no one's ever basically touched it. The first one, according to, so Maimonides, he says in his Mishnah Torah, which is sort of a summary of the entire Talmud. Maimonides is a great theologian, probably the most, the greatest theologian philosopher in Jewish history. He says that the first Kara Aduma, the first red heifer was sacrificed by Musa alayhi salam on the second of Nisan. And then, and, and the ashes can last for hundreds of years. The second one was sacrificed by Hosea, or Ezra, like 6th century BCE. And then he says there's been seven more until the destruction of the second temple and 70 of the common era by the Romans. And then, and then uh, Maimonides says, the 10th red heifer will be sacrificed by the Davidic king Messiah. Okay, so that's his opinion. So what they have now is four blemish-free red heifers, born in Texas, <laughs> Christian Zionism, right? Ig, Christian Zionism. They're probably genetically engineered. But there was five, now they're down to four. And they have, you know, the altar ready. It's on the Mount of Olives, on the second of Nisan, which is Eid of Fitur, which is in a few days, on Wednesday, that's the day that they're planning to do the sacrifice. When the Shayatina are released. <laughs> but if they do that, what's the significance of that? If they do that, then they'll take it, the Bani Israel, they'll take that as tawfiq, that they can push hard for a third temple and the priesthood. They will take that as sort of divine permission, you know, that they can just... You know, as the Quran says, when you tabiru ala ma ala tatbiru. Because the, the prize is the Temple Mount. And the Temple Mount is called the ha, Har Habayit. Har Habayit. Right? Uh, Maqdis. So, you know, Gaza, right, is a bit of a distraction, obviously, but we should pay attention to that, obviously. But the real goal is West Bank, because East Jerusalem is where the Temple Mount is. So you notice when they started attacking Gaza, they also were pushing towards the, there's no Hamas in Hamas. There's no Hamas in the West Bank. That's the real prize, is the Temple Mount. And interestingly, you know how it says, so in the Quran, right, they're going to, they're going to, they're going to humiliate you, they'll enter the Masjid al-Aqsa, eh, and they'll destroy Palestine. These latter two, are going to be really ramped up when they sacrifice the 10th red heifer. They'll have permission to do that. And it's already started, obviously with Gaza. It's, it's turned into a moonscape, as Chris Hedges says. It looks like the surface of the moon. This is what the Quran says they're going to do at the second Uru. This is a sign of their downfall. Um, and then uh, Rashid Khalidi, who wrote that book, uh, 100 Years War in Palestine, he said before October 7th, he would go on the Temple Mount and he would see pockets of Jews worshiping on the Temple Mount. He's never seen that before. So they're entering the Masjid Al-Aqsa. They're getting ready to do that. 
So the, the Red Bull, the Red Bull, sorry. All right, bulls, wet bulls gives you wings. The red heifer, in sort of theory, will give them sort of divine permission to really ramp things up to a degree that we haven't even seen before. Allahumma sta'al. But it's a big deal. I mentioned that at a khutbah, like, in December of 2022 here, and some people were like, what are you talking about, Red Heifer? Get a life. No, they didn't say that. This is weird. This is not football stuff. But, you know, it's very important. Now everyone's talking about the Red Heifers. Well, Okay. Allah tells us they're going to lose. Can I ask? Okay, so can you hear me? Assalamu alaikum. Yeah, uh, you had talked about the book, The Jewels of the Quran. I just wanted to know if you had any other book recommendations on like the study of this or that are similar, what you use to make this presentation? Um, Jewels of the Quran. Sort of similar to that. <laughs> Which part of the presentation? What time? Like the, the simple, like kind of the understanding of the, the stories in the Quran and like the verses and how you explain them to what was happening now. Um, I can or send a bibliography, I can put a bibliography, I'll send one to you. I have a bibliography with this. I, I can't think of the okay. titles off the top of my head right now. The deck is on the presentation, the video online on YouTube as well. And then when you send the bibliography, yeah. I'll put it in the description. Yeah, definitely. That's a yeah. good question. Yes. Further reading. Sorry, I can't, my brain is... No, you're good. Okay, we have a question here from the men's side. Right here. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Jazakallah for the, for the talk. Um, so, uh, recently there's been, like, among, like, Christian apologetics, um, like, more recently, like, Jordan Peterson, bringing up a diagram of cross-references within the Bible the Old Testament, the New Testament, and kind of bragging about that, the fact that there's so many gives authority to the Bible, and then they might compare it with the Quran, which doesn't have as many of those cross-references that they put up. Um, it, I don't know if you've, if, if you've heard of this or not, but is there any, is the argument that they're trying to make baseless? Is, is there any base to it? Like your thoughts, I guess. Christianity and Judaism, um, are very, very different religions. Okay. I mean, yeah, Christianity is a sort of little sister of Judaism, right, which is the sort of mother religion. But their understanding of what was everything is, is vastly different, right? I mean, Christian, like I said, Christian Zionism to me, and like Jordan Peterson is a big Zionist. And there's a group called Kufi, Christians. United for Israel, led by John Hagee. Again, Texas. It's out of Texas. What's wrong with Texas? Uh, I don't know. But the executive, the executive director of Christians United for Israel was David Brog, who was cousins of Ehud Barak, the former prime minister of Israel. You can't make this stuff up. The executive director of Christians United for Israel was a Jewish Zionist and cousin of Ehud Barak. Ba'ad 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 Ba'ad. Right? That's very strange to me. Why? Because if you read in the Talmud what the rabbi said about Jesus, you would uh, probably won't be able to eat lunch for a few weeks. Think of the most, don't think of it. But if someone was to, I always make this enough, if someone was to go into a room for 24 hours and think of the most depraved thing you can possibly say about another human being, you would not cop the rabbis in a Babylonian Talmud what they said about Isa alayhi salam and Maryam alayhi salam. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us an idea. Oh, we killed this so-called Christ, this messenger of God, of yours. You know. Gives us an idea. So this relationship is very strange to me. Christians supporting Israel. Because in the New Testament, Jesus is the new temple. It's very clear. If you read the New Testament, traditional Christianity, 
Jesus is the new temple. Jesus never talks about a third temple. He always talks about the destruction of the second temple. And he refers to himself as the new, as the next temple. So for Christians to support a third temple where sacrifices would come back by priests, this is total kufur according to traditional Christianity. Because Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice according to the New Testament. Jesus is the ultimate high priest and he's the final temple. So it's a weird relationship. It's very strange. They're kind of using each other. Pardon the analogy. Fair warning. It's like a 19-year-old girl marrying a 90-year-old man, you know, who's very rich. You know, he wants something, she wants something, but they don't really like each other, right? According to the book of Revelation, only 144,000 Jews will be converted when Jesus comes again, and they're all men, and they're all virgins. Okay. But, you know, you read the New Testament, you read early church fathers, you read Christian theologians, all the way into the 19th century, this is the idea of replacement theology, that the New Testament replaces the Old Covenant with Moses. It's supersessionism. That's traditional Christianity. You have to believe in Jesus, or else you're no longer chosen by God. It's this modern Zionist movement that is advocating this dual covenant theology, in other words, you can be Jew and still go to heaven. You don't have to believe in Jesus. Where's it coming? It's total bid'ah. It comes from nowhere. It comes from shaitan. So I don't agree with what the New Testament says. I don't believe Jesus is a third temple and he's a sacrifice. I don't believe these things, right? I don't believe these things. But if Christians would just believe their text, they have no reason to support Zionism. You know, there was a rabbi who went to Israel. This is a true story. He was a Zionist as a young man. He went there, and then he looked around and he said, this, this is horrible what we're doing to the Palestinians. And then he said, no, we have become Pharaoh. We have become Goliath. We, Bani Israel has become Pharaoh. But at least Pharaoh, the original Pharaoh, right? At least he spared the women and the girls. Right? But Pharaoh, he can't survive without Qarun and Haman. Right? So without economic and military backing, hence you have Christian Zionists. Right? Read, read a book by um, Stephen Sizer. Stephen Sizer. Uh, Roadmap to Armageddon. Wow. Oh, beautiful. Yeah, he's a Christian, Bible-believing Christian. So they're out there, but you don't hear about them. You know, sometimes you have Jews in what, the East Coast. They fill up stadiums in protest against Israel. They fill up stadiums. They fill up the, they fill up, uh, the Brooklyn Nets stadium. They cover 10 square blocks. You never hear about these people. Actually, five or six men own everything we see on television or on the internet. So regarding that, uh, the ayah about Asa Rabbukum Ayyarhamukum, what did the scholars say about the actual manifestation of the Rahmah? Is it like related to the uh, reemergence of Isa Rahmah? According to this understanding, yes, that, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will have mercy on the Muslims in the sense it will give them victory over their enemies. According to this understanding, it's an indication of the future victory. We know that there's a future victory. It's very explicit in the hadith. The Quran here is, is sort of pointing to, is an ishara to it, right? Yeah. I think we should maybe end. People are leaving. I think people are tired. Okay, sounds good. How about just because we have a lot of people online watching, we have a lot of questions online. I thought maybe you can answer just one of them, uh, just so we don't let our online viewers down. Please explain the concept of mujaddid in Islam and its application now in the recent past. Who have been the recent mujaddids. Yeah, so there's a hadith of the Prophet وسلم, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at the head of every century will send a mujaddid. Mujaddid is a renewer of the faith. Renewer of the, mm, of the teachings of the 
first generation, right? So the foundation is the understanding of the Prophet and the Sahaba, but they're applying that foundation to new circumstances as they arise. So in that sense, they're renewing the religion. So if you look throughout the centuries, you know, they say Imam Shafi'i of his century was the rejected. They say um, maybe Ahmad ibn Hanbal. So some of these, you know, there's difference of opinion. Um, Imam al-Ghazali was the rejected of the fifth century. Some say Fakhruddin al-Razi, uh, Imam Abdullah ibn Alawi al-Haddad. And then when you get into the, these later centuries, it gets a little murkier. Uh, because just as the nature of the end of time, you know. Uh, so, again, the general advice is to cling to the ulama. It's very important. The people of knowledge. This is a command from the Quran. So we have this idea of tajdeed. The religion is, is not a type of reform, right? People say, Islam needs a reformation. I say to that person, you need, you need to uh, re-inform yourself. Re-information is what you need. We don't need a reformation. We need a re-information. Right? Because what did the reformation do to Christianity? It produced this, this uh, scourge of Christian Zionism, this murderous ideology, which is now dominant amongst Protestants. Dominant. And now is infecting the Catholic Church as well. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I think that's good enough. Yeah. Always appreciate you. Thank you so much for making time for us.